Good morning, everyone. In a few moments, you will be able to join us at an event discussing sustainability and a few other critical aspects of digital transformation. And we're also going to have a few news announcements. So please welcome to Microsoft Sustainable Transformation Summit, Sweden. Gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Sustainable Transformation Summit hosted by Microsoft Sweden. My name is Mats Lewan and I will be glad to be your moderator here today at this event where we will, we will discuss a few critical aspects of digital transformation and how to make it sustainable. And we're also going to have a few important news announcements. So these are challenging times, right? And they already were before the pandemic hit upon us. Because for years, corporations, organizations, individuals, society, and even countries have struggled to reinvent themselves in order to find their way through digitalization. This is a tech-driven revolution as much as a cultural evolution. Yet, from my perspective as a futurist, I would say that digitalization essentially isn't that different from any other major technology shift or market sh shift through history. At these shifts, we all have to adapt to new conditions in order to remain competitive and to remain relevant and to find our new position in a changed and different ecosystem. The difference, however, with digitalization is that it changes so many conditions in such a profound way at the same time. So we may say that we were already entering the largest transformation ever in human history. And then the pandemic hit upon us. In a few months, it accelerated this transformation at an unparalleled rate, really acting as a catalyzer on already ongoing change from digitalization. And we have all experienced what a challenge it has been to maintain and to manage this situation in a sustainable way. And this is the topic that we would like to address today, discussing how we can learn from each other and how Microsoft can assist Swedish society and Swedish businesses in an effort to make this transformation sustainable and how to become more resilient. Data. What is it exactly? Bara ettor och nollor. Ström som slås av och på. Data är nästan ingenting alls. Det är vad vi gör med den som gör skillnad. För för tidigt födda barn. För skogarna i Sverige. För djur på väg att ut. för kommande generationer. So to initiate today's summit, I'm proud to welcome Helen Barnikov, General Manager of Microsoft Sweden. So let us first, let us first talk about today's program. Um, we're going to touch about four aspects of digital transformation, which is sustainability, trust, skilling, and the ecosystem. And I also know that you're going to make an important announcement today, Helen. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, today's main topic, sustainable transformation, what would you say, what does that mean for you? So thank you, Mats, and it's great to be here with you today. Uh, so sustainable transformation, to me, it really is about how can we manage that change, all those changes we see and we saw in the movie today, and how can we do that in a sustainable way? And it has to be good for the planet, it has to be good for society, for humans, and for business. And there is a way to do that, and I think fundamentally it is about combining technology and value-based leadership. And it's a long-term approach. It's something we do for the long term. It's a long journey. And it does require some bold objectives and targets that are really authentic for us to go after. 
And we base this really on three pillars. And the first one, and we'll talk about that here today, of course, is the digital infrastructure. There is an ever-increasing demand for capacity. So, of course, how we build our infrastructure and how we can scale it and make use of it really does matter for sustainability and for the transformation. It is about getting more compute power out of the energy used and, of course, using renewable energy. Really important. The second point, I would say, has to do with as people. Uh, it's about how do we create our way of working in our lives in a sustainable way. And, and as you said, we have really fast forwarded our way of doing this during the pandemic. But it is, of course, about using the technical tools and the platforms we have. But it's more than that. It's about the culture. It's about leadership. And it's certainly about self-leadership. And I think it's all up to us, actually, how we change in this aspect. And the third part is really about the ecosystems and the partnerships. To be able to do this, to be able to address these types of challenges, we have to collaborate in new ways, not just the partnerships we had before, but there will be new partnerships to co-create and to co-innovate. And one of the things that I think is actually new for us is that it also will include that we exchange data and that we build these partnerships on data. And that takes a few new things for us, not the least it takes trust. We need to trust each other to be able to do that. And I look forward to seeing many new partnerships between established companies and, and startups between, across industries. That's a really important thing to really resolve for some of these new challenges we see. And I think we will come back to trust, but trust will be a fundamental piece for us to be able to do that. So thank you. Those are many, many topics, but I hear a strong message about working together. And, and I also think about how um, digital technology has made this increasingly possible, letting people uh, collaborate across the world. And talking about working together, you're talking about partnerships and the importance of those. Uh, could you develop that, please? Yeah. No, I think the, we've, in a way, maybe always worked in, in partnerships. And I actually do think that Sweden has an advantage here because we are quite good at collaborating. But I think many of these partnerships are, are um, new in its nature because it's maybe not the type of partners we had before. It's maybe not only transactional, for example. And you will meet many of our partners here today. So we call many of our customers today, they're actually partners. When we talk about some of the announcements we're doing today, customers, part of it, they, we see them as partners. We become partners in a new business model. We become partners in actually solving for the climate change. And that's why I come into that, that you need to have an infinite um, level of trust between you because you have to exchange more, more uh, information, more data and create flows between you actually. So let's talk about another aspect, which is the skilling aspect. We are moving into a more tech intensive mm. world. That's obvious. We'll, all industries and all roles yeah. are somehow supported by technology. And we also see an increase in demand for deep technical skills. But um, at the same time, we read alarming reports on this demand and the lack of, of skills maybe. And I also hear the need for a deeper understanding of, uh, among decision makers uh, about how technology can both transform and, and uh, support their organization uh, and even society. And then many of us also see a risk for a divided society. So these are many challenges. How do you think we can address them all through mm. skilling? I think this may be one of the most important uh, topic for Sweden as society, actually. And, and yes, we're in a good position because we are tech intense, we are curious, we are quite connected for being a country. And, and we have access, access to innovative solutions and, and we are surrounded by it. But I do believe there is a growing need for skilling and, and the pace is accelerating because the pace around us is exponential. So you cannot think about your skilling the way you did it 10 years ago, but not even a year ago. What's the pace for you to always refill? And one of it is as, as maybe um, fundamental as you say, it's to, to bridging the digital divide that you will otherwise get in society. Mm -hmm. The ones who can uh, make use of all the, those technical innovations and the ones who cannot. So to me, it's very fundamental from that perspective. And it's also to provide uh, specialized skilling. And it's both to build those partnerships uh, to be able to do that, but it's also to actually address the societal challenges that we saw here, here already in the beginning. So it's, it's a broad spectrum from technical skills, specialty skills, and it's digital upskilling broadly. And we have set a target for ourselves to contribute to upskilling 150,000 Swedes 
And right. that can only be done if we do partnerships well. Okay, right. Um, I know that we're soon going to hear more about your skilling initiatives uh, later in the program. Um, but another topic that you already talked about, which is important, um, is uh, trust. So what does trust mean for you? And mm. how, why are you pushing for this, this topic so much? Yeah. No, I think trust is uh, much more than security features. We will come back to that because that's really important, as well as reliability and resilience. But trust is more than that. And trust is so fundamental to have successful partnerships, and uh, which we touched upon. And I think transparency and predictability uh, are two of the main factors of building trust. And now we're back to actually a value-driven leadership and to be authentic in your goals. So when you tie this together, I think you have a strong fundament. Uh, so trust is about how we do business and why we do business. So that feels authentic. Um, and I think it's, um, it's putting trust into technology. How do we trust the technology that we now encourage our customers and partners to actually use? And we will also talk, talk more about that. But both the trust in technology and trust in the people and trust in how we do business and why we do business. They, to me, build up trust together. So, right. So in this investment you're doing, it's clear that you have a, committed to, a commitment to build a trusted platform. You also uh, mentioned the need for a green uh, digital mm. infrastructure as a key for sustainable transformation earlier. So could you please tell us a little bit about what mm. sustainability means from a technology point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. And I would say that sustainability and mitigating the, um, our environmental footprint, it's really something which is in... Microsoft's uh, DNA that has been there for a long time. And it led us to make a corporate announcement, I believe it was at Davos in, um, in uh, September, and make significant strategic commitments to how we want to, um, how we want to fuel innovation and, and the connections while we actually reduce the footprint. And we have four areas. We have carbon, we have waste, biodiversity and water that are our focus areas. And for Sweden, we are really doubling down on carbon and waste because that's so important for Sweden. And the ambitious goals that we set was that Microsoft should be carbon negative by 2030. By 2050, Microsoft should have taken back everything that has been emitted since the company was started, which is a very, talking about bold goals that are really uh, really uh, stretching us. And to do that, uh, Microsoft also deployed a climate innovation fund of one billion, knowing that this is not something you can do on your own, knowing that we have to do this with partners and we have to do this with other innovative companies. And I find that uh, really, I find that really um, both exciting, but also motivating for how we drive our different partnerships. Oh, that, that's a strong commitment for um, collaborate with your partners and customers in, in, to see Sweden in making a sustainable transformation. Mm. Helen, uh, I believe it would be time to hear what announcement you're going to make today that you think will support Sweden on this journey. Yes, super happy to get to that point. Thank you, Mats. We're very excited to announce another major milestone in something that we have been working on for quite some time here in Sweden. Today, Microsoft confirms the launch of a world-class sustainable data center region in Sweden with presence in Gävle, Sandviken and Staffanstorp. Microsoft has selected Sweden as the site for one of the most advanced sustainable data center designs due to the country's very strong commitment to both sustainability and innovation. The new data center region in Sweden will be the first hyperscale cloud sites to track and match hourly energy consumption and 100% renewable energy in a commercial product using the Vattenfall 24-7 for greater accuracy, transparency in renewable energy matching. Microsoft's data centers in Sweden will seek zero waste certification and will include a Microsoft Circular Center designed to extend the life cycle and service through reuse and support the circular economy for the Microsoft Cloud. Sweden's Microsoft Cloud region will include Microsoft Azure, Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. The new data center region will address growing demand for secure enterprise-grade cloud services in Sweden with the ability to store data at rest in the country. And we're thrilled to announce that we will launch in 2021. Thanks, Helen. I mean, this is really interesting indeed. And we're going to see these announcements from different perspectives later today in the program. But 
First, what do you think the, is the most important way that Microsoft Swedish data center establishment will help support sustainable transformation? I think that's a great question, Mats. And we are going to actually ask that question to the president of Microsoft, Mr. Brad Smith. Oh. Hello, I'm Microsoft president Brad Smith, and I am really delighted to be with you for at least a, a few minutes today for what I know is a really important conference. I thought I'd share a few details and update, if you will, about the work that Microsoft is doing in Sweden, in particular around our data center regions, something that we announced last year. This is something that I think is important for Sweden. It's certainly important for Microsoft, but I hope it's also going to be good for the world because that's what we're aiming to do with our focus on sustainability. Now, of course, you might ask, why build data centers in Sweden? They could be built somewhere else. And I think the answer is there are some very important benefits for companies, for employers and the people of Sweden through this type of investment. Access to data will be faster. It provides a new level of capability to every institution in Sweden. And we're seeing this by Swedish customers, not just in running their businesses more profitably, but by achieving a number of other goals as well. A great example, I think, is SAS, which is using our cloud and predictive modeling to reduce the waste of food by as much as 45 percent, something that obviously contributes to the world's sustainability more broadly. But by building data centers and operating them in Sweden, we're also able to bring world-class security, our billion-dollar annual investment in security, to Sweden itself. We're able to store data in Sweden. We're able to ensure that it's not only protected by our technology, but by Sweden's own privacy laws. But I want to then spend a minute on what I think in some ways is one of the most important issues of our time, clearly the issue of the decade and the century, environmental sustainability. We're living through COVID-19 as this decade begins, but I have to believe that when we get to the end of this decade, we're going to be talking a lot more about climate than COVID. And this is where I hope and believe that our dedication to a more sustainable future will really pay dividends in Sweden itself. As you may know, we announced at the beginning of this year that Microsoft will be carbon negative as a company by the end of, that, of the decade, meaning we'll be removing from the environment more carbon than we emit each and every year. When it comes to our data centers, this has a number of really important implications. First, we are focused on making our data centers more energy efficient each and every year. So they frankly use less electricity. Already we're seeing that our hyperscale data centers like the ones for Sweden are 93% more energy efficient and 98% more carbon efficient than a traditional on-premise data center. So that is the first significant step forward that we are taking, simply by bringing these data centers to Sweden. But of course, the second thing we're doing is ensuring that they run on renewable energy. We've said that by the year 2025, all of our data centers, including the data centers in Sweden, will be based on 100% green or renewable energy. We're also working with partners to bring new machine learning technology that will further drive efficiencies in the way our data centers consume electricity. Our data centers in Sweden will be the first in the world to bring world-class hyperscale technology together with the Valenfall 24 by 7 technology that we believe is going to provide a foundation, not just for us in Sweden, but around the world. And we're focused not just on carbon and electricity, but we're also focused on things like waste and water recycling as well. We've also said that we'll be a zero waste company by the year 2030. And we will be building in Sweden what we call a circular or circularity center that basically recycles in an environmentally friendly way all of the servers and technology that we use. Now, 2020 has been a year where we have set a lot of ambitious goals. We've made a lot of promises, if you will. But 
Actually, what's most encouraging to me as the president of this company is to see the progress we've made in executing against these promises. Across Microsoft, our operational and our technology teams have been moving forward. Even just this one year alone, we've issued an RFP to remove a million metric tons of carbon from the environment. So this is not going to be a case of a lot of talk and a little bit of action. For us, for our commitment to Sweden, it's all about setting high and ambitious goals, but making them real. I hope I'll have the opportunity to be invited back because I'd love to share with you in another year what I hope will be a lot more than what will feel like 12 months of progress. Thank you very much. So, Helen, uh, that was interesting. Uh, really interesting me message from, from mm. Brad. Uh, and I found several takeaways there. And one of them is that you're going out to offer the possibility to store data in Sweden. Is yes. that correct? Yes, indeed. So with this data center opening, um, the Microsoft Cloud will help customers to secure local data residency uh, requirements when that's necessary for our customers. Right. And, and, and another takeaway uh, is that you're going, you have an ambition to have 100% renewable energy yes. uh, um, for these data centers in 2025. But that's immediate in Sweden, isn't it? In Sweden, it's immediate. It's worldwide, it's 2025. And in Sweden, it will be from start. And as Brad mentioned, it will be the first uh, also using the Vattenfall matching 24-7, which gives that transparency right. uh, that we are actually living up to that. So uh, this is a really important message. And uh, we're going to talk about more about 24-7 later, I know that. Uh, another thing that I find impressive is this zero waste objective. Mm. Uh, what do you say about that? Yeah, this zero waste objective, maybe we haven't talked about that so much, but this is really important and Microsoft has made very strong statements on, on really being part of reducing that, uh, that world problem. And today, the servers have an average lifespan span of five years. So, of course, it's a con big contribution to this, uh, this uh, e-waste problem. So, to, do, to, to plan to repurpose and recycle these devices become really important. So, the inclusion of the Microsoft Circular Center to the Swedish data centers is a very, very important component for Sweden. Okay, that's interesting, and thank you so much, Helen. We're going to see you again for a wrap-up at the end of the summit today about, in about an hour, so uh, thank you again. And now I think we're really excited to get to the first of today's topic and the program, which is sustainability. And with the steadily increased pace of change that we already talked about, it's clear that the challenges facing our environment remain. We need to continue to create and maintain the conditions under which human and nature can exist in productive harmony to support present and future generations. And this covers how we address a series of challenging environmental challenge, uh, challenges such as global warming, land and water protection, waste management and maintaining biodiversity. And technology can help find solutions to these issues. Uh, and we're going to start to look at a very nice example of such a technology application uh, at the Swedish Forest Agency, Skogsstyrelsen, where I talked to senior uh, advisor Halil Radogoshi a few days ago. So let's have a look at what he explained to me. Hey, Halil. Hi, Matt. So uh, you're working at the Swedish Forest Agency and uh, you're using drones to inspect large areas of trees and forests. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes. Uh, when dealing with forest damages, we have a short time frame where we are able to see the damages and do something about them. In today's approach, we have forest experts who are looking at these damages, damages and making an action plan of them by using the drone imageries. We have trained an AI model that is able to help the experts do this work, identify inventory and follow up the damages. So the expert, they can focus only on the validation of the results. Let me demonstrate you how this work in practice. Oh, great. Good. On the left hand side, you have a video of the drone imagery, original drone imagery. And uh, on the right side, you can see how the AI model automatically detects the type of trees and the damages. Well, that's impressive. I mean, from the screen, we can see that the data analysis is really fast. So I wonder um, what happens next in the following step based on these data points? Uh, when, they, when the experts have validated the results, they, it means that they'd be able to cover much larger area that they should 
that they would have, would have done without the use of the AI model. Another important thing that is that entire knowledge into all the lessons learned and even more data will we will feed into the model. So next year's model is going to be even better than the one from from this year. Okay, so I mean, essentially, you're using an AI model that supports human work uh, in to be able to uh, speed up the search for damaged trees. Uh, but I guess it took some time just to develop this technology. It did, but we started with a small project on large case bearer. And when we were done with it, we went to the bigger challenges like spruce bark beetle and elm dutch disease. We even built an entire cloud platform that is able to, to manage the models from data gathering, model design, model development and distribution. We call this AI model factory. And we are willing to share this knowledge with other parts in the board because we know that the forest damage, they are not unique in Sweden. They are everywhere the, where there is forest. And by sharing this knowledge, we want to impact the biodiversity worldwide. Oh, that's a great example. So many thanks for the work that you're doing at the Swedish uh, Forest Agency. Thanks, Halin. Thank you, Mats. So yes, I really found this example interesting and uh, ex yeah, really inspiring. So I, and I keep saying that it is the sum of technologies and applications like this that slowly changes the world. So um, let us stay at the topic of sustainability. And I'm glad to welcome here today uh, Panila Bunde from the Housing Association HSB and Andreas Regnell from the Swedish power company Vattenfall. So Andreas, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, your new solution 24-7 that was mentioned mentioned by Helen earlier today, uh, and uh, it's a solution to, to support 100% renewable power supply to these uh, data centers, like Microsoft Data Center. But could you please explain to us a little bit more what 24-7 is? Basically what we do is that we match the consumption and the supply hour by hour. Uh, and that makes it possible to actually say that if you are 100% renewable, you're actually 100% renewable hour by hour. So it's, it's becoming uh, having a renewable supply for real. And, and that's, of course, a very important step in, in for Microsoft to be able to re realize their vision. So, so I think that's uh, very positive. But I think it has broader implications than that. First, secondly, it's an example of, of digitalizing the energy value chain, which is a prerequisite for, in the end, having a completely uh, fossil-free energy system. And thirdly, and, and, and linked to that, I think it's, it's, it's super that we have this solution with Microsoft, but if we were to get more companies on the same type of, of, of solution, eventually we would make it clear and, and, uh, and support the transformation of the energy system so that even in an, the future we'll have a security supply that we're after. And, and, and this is an important step in, in reaching that. I find it interesting, and I, I know better what it is, 24-7. It, it is impressive, this hour by hour thing. So um, let's go to you, Pernilla. I, I know that HSB has also a great commitment for sustainability and that you're working hard to find solutions to mitigate the energy need for households. Because I, I read that households stand for 35% uh, of our country's energy consumption, which is uh, a great bit, right? So HSB has something called a living lab. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and what your ambitions are with that, with that investment? Yes, uh, HSB um, uh, manages and develops uh, houses for one million people in Sweden. And we have 10% of the uh, Swedish people live in HSB. So of course we have a great responsibility, but we also have a great uh, insight in uh, how people want to live. So we have developed HSB Living Lab together with some partners. And this is a globally unique arena where we study uh, how to develop the next generation's uh, living. And um, we have lots of partners. For example, we have NASA, uh, where we uh, uh, have a, a research project that we, where we look how to uh, wash clothes without water, for example. So we have lots of interesting uh, uh, projects in Nature's Believing Lab. And I think that this is also a good example on how you can combine the data analysis with um, the sustainability. For one example, we have 2,000 sensors in HSB Living Lab, where 40 students live, and we collect data and analy analyze this for how we can be more sustainable in the future. So it's a good example. Well, that's an interesting lab. I must, uh, must get some more information about it later. I want to know more. Uh, getting back to you, Andrea. So you've been working together with HSB to, to ensure carbon-free energy. Uh, do you have any other collaboration regarding sustainability challenges? 
Yeah, I, I think we, we believe strongly in that to, to, to really go forward forcefully on these issues, one need to form partnerships as with AH, H, HSB and Microsoft. But maybe w another one that we're very kind of proud of and has big impact partnership is the one we have with SSAB and LKAB called Hybrid, yeah. where the objective is to produce fossil free steel by essentially exchanging coal in the process of the blast furnace with, with um, direct, reduction and, uh, direct reduction and the hydrogen instead. So instead of getting CO2 as an emission, we get water uh, as an emission. And, and I think that's a, a very interesting example for, for some of you that followed the news. Yesterday, one of our partners, LKAB, announced that they will essentially introduce that technology for the entire production of iron ore, right. uh, which would be an enormous uh, reduction of CO2. So the technology that we develop uh, together, one of the partners is already committing to using it, and, and that alone would be able to reduce 35 million tons of CO2. And, and uh, the, the challenge there is, of course, that there needs a lot of hydrogen and, in turn, electricity. Right. Uh, that's a challenge. But it's really impressive, those numbers. I can imagine that a lot of innovation is going on to, to reach that goal and later. So, uh, Panela, um, a lot is going on within HSB right now. Uh, you're in the middle of a huge digital transformation as we speak. Uh, tell me more about that, please. Well, uh, it's a big um, challenge for us. Uh, we go from uh, automating lots of uh, things from having done it manually. Uh, and uh, it turns upside down the whole business from uh, doing things manually, you now do it uh, uh, digital. And of course, we want to keep uh, um, the local connection with the members and customers, even if we go digitalized. So it's a, it's a it's a big challenge for us all and, uh, and also for the leadership in the organization to achieve this. Uh, one example that we have made is that we um, uh, went into the clouds with Microsoft. And of course, that was very, very important for us, just both when it comes to digital safety, but also when it comes to environmental issues. Okay, uh, and then re just talking about uh, environment and regarding sustainability at HSB, what would you say are your biggest challenges there? Well, when the Agenda 2030 came, were announced, uh, we were very quickly to adopt those uh, goals and we broke them down to what's, uh, what's important for HSB as we have a real, um, we have a challenge uh, in, 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 in all of Sweden and in the whole world, I think. Uh, the, the biggest challenge is to go from uh, planning to action, I think. And one example that we have done now is that we have um, produced the biggest solar farm in Sweden, in Strängnäs, and I think that's uh, really, really impressive. I am also very impressed by Microsoft's uh, goals when it comes to climate positive. That is something that is, as a partner, is challenging us very much, and I think that I'm impressed by it, and it's, it's something that we can, as a partner, go hand in hand with. And of course, they have this um, um, data center now, we are building it in Sweden, and for us, it's very important and a good example of how we can go as a, as a partner to also become sustainable in collaboration. Right, thanks, Pernilla. That's, that's uh, impressive, really. So, Andreas, what would you say are the biggest challenges uh, for Vattenfall, or, or businesses in general, for that matter, uh, when facing, uh, uh, when it comes to working in a sustainable way? I think, in the end, we want to have a climate-neutral world by 2050, at the latest. And uh, we, we begin to understand quite a lot what is needed. And, and as an example, the, the LKB announcement yesterday on the, about the fossil-free uh, iron sponge production. They say, well, we need 50 terawatt hours. Then we know that we need to digitalize the whole energy value chain. We, need that, we know that we need to, to uh, electrify essentially all transport. We know that we need a lot of, uh, of biofuels for avi aviation until we potentially manage to do electrical uh, aviation. And, and, and we know that we need a lot of networks and we know all these things. But on the one hand, we cannot do it all at once because we just don't have the resources. It's just not enough money and people out there to do it. At the same time, we know that we need to do all of it. And I think that's a challenge that we need to think about together. In what order do we need to do this? Right. Because we need uh, to be able to take some steps. We need the CO2 price that, uh, that incentivizes certain things. And, and then we need some network. And then we need some production. And, and, and really that we sit together, as, especially the big companies, but all the stakeholders in society, 
thinking that through a bit, because otherwise it, there is a risk that we kind of stumble on our, on, 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 in our efforts to, to go forward. So we begin to see all the components, and now we just need to just we need to <laughs> we need to arrange them in the right order so that we actually can because they each of them take a step stepping stone on each other and and that's tricky. But yeah, it's it. tricky. That's a small part of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think part. we're going to, to manage to do that too. Thank you very much, Panela and Andreas. Very very interesting input on this topic of sustainability. So the next topic that we're going to discuss now is trust and security in a digital world and. It's obvious that a cloud enables fantastic opportunity, but nobody wants to use technology or technology providers that they don't trust. So this is obviously crucial. And I sometimes say that trust and security and, 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 and both of them is the elephant in the room. But fortunately, there are skilled people dedicating all their work to this area. Trust in the Microsoft Cloud uh, is based on a trust and verify model. So Microsoft is one of the world's most compliant IT platforms with more than 90 uh, compliance offerings. Ranging from GDPR to regional, national or ISO security standards. So these compliance standards are then validated by third parties to ensure that Microsoft complies with them. On the topic of data residency, the Microsoft Cloud in Sweden will be one of the largest data centers in this region with full redundancy between several data centers to make it possible to provide data residency at rest in Sweden. Thanks for this message. And so uh, I'm glad to welcome a true expert on trust and security, Daniel Lakanina from Microsoft Sweden, who we just saw in, in this short video. So Daniel, to start, can you please give us a short update on the current situation of trust and uh, technology? Sure, sure. So if I could get, yeah. So I think what we have been talking about for kind of the last decade or so, when the cloud computing started to uh, arise, was really how are we going to be able to trust the cloud computing architecture because it is some kind of a black box model. So the security models of the cloud computing architecture is really about you are not necessarily allowed to go into that black box and open it up. You are not allowed to go and feel every server. You're not allowed to ask everybody exactly how they're doing. So how do we build a model that basically means that you can trust that black box? And I think the model that has been developed, not only by Microsoft, but by all hyperscale providers, is a model about trust and verify. So you have to be able to trust something that supplier is stating about this black box, and you need also the tools to be able to verify that this is true. So I think the model that has been created is really a dialogue with components, what normally is certifications, uh, and audits of those certifications that basically have been able to, to verify the, 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 the promises that's made on this black box. So then you also have the question, who is then responsible for security and trust? And that question is not always as super simple uh, to, ask, uh, to answer because it's not only the cloud provider that's uh, responsible. You also have a responsibility as a customer for security and compliance. And I think the most interesting you know, kind of, uh, of uh, uh, dialogue that we are having as a uh, customer and, and consumer is in the section between when you actually deliver over the responsibility. It could be seen as some kind of a gray area because there is a lot of opportunities for misunderstandings in that gray area. So it has to be super clear and crisp uh, of how that's actually is going to uh, be delivered. So 
what has been created then uh, is something called uh, the shared responsibility model. So if you are working in this area, this is something that you probably have uh, seen. So the answer to who is responsible, it really uh, depends on what kind of service that you are using. So if you are using uh, things like a software as a service model, that means that you are putting a lot of responsibilities on the provider from compliance perspective, but also from the security perspective. However, if you are using cloud services, which is more of the on-prem solutions or the infrastructure solutions, you are responsible for more of the pieces when it comes to security and compliance uh, because you have control in a way of the operating system, etc. And with control also comes uh, responsibilities. So what we have heard from a lot of customers is saying, yeah, we understand. We understand that we have all these responsibilities when it comes to security and compliance. Uh, but can you help us to some extent? To help us with best practice of how we do uh, security, best practice how we do uh, compliance, etc. And for you that has been uh, around for a while, we actually had that. Uh, 10 years ago, there was something called the Microsoft uh, Municipality Design. And that was designed to help municipalities in Sweden with the technical guidelines on how do you use the components of the Microsoft architecture? How do you put them together? What kind of architecture uh, components should you use, etc.? And this was uh, hugely successful. So I think at some point in time, almost all municipalities in Sweden were using the design uh, of the MS uh, Kaade, which it was called. And people have been asking us for many years now, saying, well, wouldn't it be uh, would it be great if we actually had the same kind of best practice and designs also for the cloud? But you also have to remember that the cloud is a little bit different than the uh, traditional infrastructure or on-prem architecture. So the original design from the Microsoft Municipality design was really based on technology. The technology guidelines, the components, etc. In the cloud, you actually have less technology components, less infrastructure component, and you have more of the legal and the compliance issues that you have to, to deal with. So it's a little bit different guidelines. But uh, today, uh, I am very happy to say that we have listened. We have heard you, and today we are also announcing. Uh, a Microsoft cloud design for the public sector. So what is the Microsoft cloud design for the public sector? It contains a lot of different components. But basically it is founded on a blueprint of security and information security, compliance models, policies, recommendations, uh, and different kinds of tools. And we are launching this together with seven different partners as launch partners like Atea, Tieto, NordCloud and a lot of other partners as well. It's going to help customers to learn more about this cloud model, to understand how the compliance and legal issues works, what kind of components that you can use to address these legal issues, etc. And also to, uh, to basically test uh, and, uh, and verify that this is working. And we're hoping this is something that's going to be developed as well in the public sector uh, and basically be adopted to a lot of different use cases as well. So we're very happy and very curious of how this is going to be adopted in the, uh, in the public sector. Thank you, Donald. That's interesting. Uh, uh, this sounds like something that the public se sector has been wanting for some time. So uh, what will happen now? What will happen now? So right. if you look at the next week, uh, we will launch this on December 1st. So on December 1st, you will have a website where you can basically download the documents, go into the details of the documents, and also get in contact with a lot of our partners that can help you to get training uh, on this program. Okay. Thank you, sounds good. Uh, you know, I'm really happy that there are people looking 24-7 on trust and security, although you, I know, and you have reminded me again that I have to do my part as well, both as a customer and as an industrial partner. So thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Really. Uh, now we're going to discuss another topic that I find highly interesting, which is skilling. 
And in Sweden, I think you all agree that we have come a long way in our digital development. We are connected, we are curious, and we have gained access to innovative solutions that simplify our lives. Despite this, we see a growing demand for technical skills, new skills in all parts and at all levels in society. And we know that 70,000 IT experts are going to be needed by 2022 in Sweden. At the same time, almost one million Swedes say that they want to work within IT, and many of them are willing to spend up to a year to skill development to get there. Still, there is a warning about lack of skill. So this topic has so many aspects, and in a short time frame, we try to highlight just a few of them. First, Paul Englis from Microsoft will tell us how Microsoft will provide and support skilling opportunities in relation to the new data centers in Sweden. Hey, all of you in Sverige. I hope that you are well and that you are fresh in your specialty. Hello from Seattle to all of my friends in Sweden. I hope you're staying safe and well during this challenging time. I'm Paul Inglis with the Microsoft Data Center Community Development Team. We are very excited about the announcement of the new region for cloud services that Microsoft will deliver from the data centers we're building in Sweden. And while those cloud services will light up in the coming year, my colleagues and I on the community team uh, along with our friends at Microsoft Sweden, have been busy making connections with our new neighbors in Javla, Sandviken, and Staffenstorp. Our community work is built on listening and learning, and we started our conversations more than a year ago with community leaders, educators, um, business owners, and neighbors. You told us about the priorities that are important to you, things like building digital literacy, workforce development for trade skills for 21st century jobs, building community connections for your youth, as well as new arrivals to your communities, and developing innovative solutions to support environmental sustainability. Earlier this year, we were proud to announce our first collaborations and community investments. Those included things like Rapatak and support for their youth centers in Javla and Sadviken, support for Code Centrum and the work they're doing with educators and youth in Javla, Sandviken, and Staffenstorp to help them adapt to online teaching and learning. Uh, work with the Upakra Archaeological Center in Staffenstorp as they digitize artifacts and develop education programs for local school children. We're also excited about collaborating with Innovation Skona on two environmental sustainability projects in Staffenstorp. The first is a circular water challenge a competition hosted by Venture Cup to identify the smartest, most innovative systems for food production. The second is a waste identification test bed being built by Mobile Heights. This project will incorporate test sensors for the automated identification of waste. Creating a circular economy for materials and a better market for reused materials all starts with better identification of the materials using those sensors. Earlier this month, we celebrated the opening of data center labs at Polomskolum in Javla and San Baca Science Park in San Viken. Um, these labs are equipped with donated equipment from Microsoft data centers, and the labs will be used as part of our ongoing collaboration to deliver IT workforce training to local community members. We are very excited about this project, and we thank the municipalities for their help in delivering this important uh, project. Investing in communities that host Microsoft data centers is very important to us. You've welcomed us into your towns and we will strive to be good neighbors. We are proud to have collaborated with 13 organizations across the three communities, but we're just getting started. So we look forward to continuing our conversations with community members and finding new opportunities for joint collaborations across Javla, Sunbeacon, and Staffenstorp. So thanks, Paul. I think this gave us a good picture of Microsoft's commitment to provide skilling opportunities in the digital field in Sweden. Uh, and we're going to stay at this topic uh, about skilling, and I'm glad to have a panel here. So I would like to introduce to you Lisa Gunnarsson from LinkedIn Nordics, Pia Sandvik from the Swedish Research Institute RISE, and Panila Johansson from the consultancy firm Sigma Young Talent. Welcome to all the three of you. Um, let's start with you, Lisa. Uh, many organizations today are focusing on skilling and reskilling. So, how, how do you look upon that at LinkedIn? 
Well, first of all, I think this is a phase of reskilling. It's a phase of learn it all rather than know it all, as Satya once said. I think at LinkedIn, we've kicked off a number of really big initiatives to try and support the both the global and the local reskilling need. One of the most important ones have actually been with Microsoft in driving reskilling for over 25 million people over the globe. We started in May, June, when we were assessing what are the jobs in demand, not just during the pandemic, but actually after. It's, uh, got a, a kind of core list of these would be the skills and behaviors and experiences needed. Then we kicked off an initiative to uh, create a free learning skill set of about a thousand hours in our LinkedIn learning portfolio that we made available for the entire globe uh, in order to reskill to, to the skills that are in demand for the future. So together with Microsoft, we've been driving this initiative for the last uh, five to six months. We've uh, accomplished about 13 million people have reskilled, uh, 60,000 of them being in Sweden uh, alone and the ambition is then to hit 25 million. So we're very happy for that progress so far, but still yet to come. Okay, yet to come. Those are large numbers, but it's the future that, that's coming towards us. Uh, when, when would you say, I don't think people are really aware of this yet, in, in, in ordinary people, right? When do you think that this will be common knowledge? That is, it's obvious to everyone that we need to reskill. That we need to risk. Yeah. Well, I think I think lots of people are aware, but I'm not sure that everyone knows how to reskill and what to learn. So I usually think about this as like it's not when we talk about digital skills, which is obviously the like the biggest need of the future for every single role that is out there. It's all about maybe envisioning yourself as you were an individual contractor, non-dependent of role that you have, and think of if I would be selling my time to someone, actually invoicing my time, what would be the skills that they would want to pay me? for in one to two to three years from now? And then what would be the skills that digital skills in my role that I would have to maybe comply to? So I would think it out of that perspective. Right, I think that's a good message. So let, let's go to you, Pia. Uh, Rice recently launched an initiative called the Academy for Lifelong Learning. So aiming at business leaders in the public sector. Mm. Uh, please tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's an initiative together with Microsoft, Google, Telia and Ericsson, among others. And we have launched this because we see a, a, a huge need for uh, competence um, development in public sector. And it's aimed to lead us in governments, in municipalities and regions over as well. And we have three focuses that we target in this uh, education. And it's citizen perspective, but it's also, also digital toolbox and leadership, of course, in a rapidly changing, changing world, world. And we will have a pilot this autumn where we will, where will, where we will launch this. And I think by creating a, a system for education for Academy of Lifelong Learning towards public sector, we will really be able to create learning organizations and create better conditions for those that work in public sector. And it will give us a public sector that will really be better settled for the continuous transformation that will continue. Right, I, and, and I know that we've been talking about this. Uh, one difficulty for the public sector is to, to be able to take risks. Normally yeah. they don't do that no. for different reasons. So could you, could you explain a little bit what you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's normally it's you, you don't you don't have the citizens that really make a force for, for transformation, I would say, in the way that you have when you run a normal business. And therefore, I think we have to have a public sector that we give trust to be more innovative, to take more risk. And innovation may, means failure sometimes, but it, you need to do failure sometimes in order to be successful as well. Well, that's true, yeah. Mm. Uh, it's a difficult situation, though. Uh, Pernilla, um, yeah. Sigma Young Talent launched a new initiative today, it's yeah. great news, uh, together with Microsoft, uh, called the Future Skills Program, right? Yeah. That will focus on the development of young talents in the areas of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So yeah. please tell us a little bit more. Of course. So why is AI and cybersecurity important? There will be increased need for competence within AI and cybersecurity because everything in our world is going to be digitized and connected. We are in the forefront of these areas in Sweden today, but we need to increase the number of people who can innovate and develop. And uh, we also want to support our customer to have the competence they need to transform their product and services into the new future 
And we think the best way to do that is to working with the leading experts. And since we have worked with Microsoft for a couple of years, it was really natural for us to start this initiative together. And this initiative is an acceleration program that in the first step will focus on IA and cybersecurity because this is once needed. Uh, to make sure that we stay in the forefront of digitalization. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, uh, please, yeah. yeah. And uh, the plan for 2021 is to have 100 future experts in our acceleration program. That's a good goal. Yeah. Um, I, I, talking about cybersecurity and AI as, as yeah. the main topics here, um, do, can you separate them or, or are they depending on each other? Do, do everyone have to learn both? Or, or how do you look upon that? Yeah, I think everyone has to learn both because they are connected to each other. Mm. Yeah, so I think so. So that is the plan. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we, we need to, to hear more about this uh, yeah. initiative later. Yeah. Anyway, Lisa, at LinkedIn, I know that you have access to a lot of, of data uh, mm. showing movements and trends. So uh, which would you say are the most interesting trends we should look out for when it comes to scaling? Well, I think it's how the digital skill is progressing. So we can see that there is a 3x, so 300% more uh, learning around the digital skills this year compared to last year. So that's a quite, quite impressive trend, actually, just viewing that. But then I also think that it's all about like how we're connecting, how we're networking together to exchange that skill, to support and learn together as a network. And we can also see that uh, our increase of network connections between members has increased with 50%, our network connections when it comes to publishing content has increased with 50%. So all of these things together are tying into the community that we want to see in what Satya said is a learn it all, not a know it all network. So it's really a networking effect of people collaborating more and being more I together. I think that will be essential. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Uh, Pia, uh, we can also spot a trend that organizations like RISE are taking more responsibility for lifelong learning. Um, what do you think is needed to make this happen? Yeah, first of all, I think that the, today's systems and structures, they, don't, they are not made for this continuous development and, and, and skilling that's needed. And it, because we need to make major shifts. And I would say that the Swedish education system today is not made for that. Because you have to be able to, to develop your competence while you're still working. And I think that need, we need something really, really new. So I, we, have, we think we need to create digital infrastructures for lifelong learning. And there we need to have test and demonstration environments where you can really test, test and develop your competence at the same time. And also digital infrastructures for lifelong learning where we can show what kind of, of um, training you can actually do. So there's a lot of transformation needed, I would say. Yeah. We need a lot there to go on with. Uh, Pernilla, uh, uh, so last question. Um, looking into the future, well, I usually say that future starts today, but yeah, you probably know that. Yeah. So uh, what skills do you think are the most important in, in the future, starting today, obviously? Yeah, except AI and cybersecurity. Yeah. yeah, I think also that uh, some soft skills are going to be more important, like uh, E taking ethical responsibility, attitudes and values, because now we are going to create products for a better humanity and a better tomorrow. And I think soft skills is also going to be more important. I'm going to remember that. Yeah. It's an important message. Yeah. Thank you, Thank soft you. skills. Yeah. Okay, many thanks to Lisa, Pia and Pernilla for your interesting input on skilling. So let's now move on to the fourth and the last of today's topics, uh, the ecosystem. And it's no coincidence that we borrowed this term from nature because the conditions are very similar. Transformation is a collective journey and we all need a strong ecosystem to succeed based on trust, sustainability and innovation. A large or small incumbent or startup, in times of strong <coughs> change, we all need to look up and to find our new position in a new and changed ecosystem. It's just different ecosystem, just like in nature. And as in nature, we need to seek smart collaborations and coalitions to be successful. So 
This is a, a very, very interesting topic. Uh, let's remain at this and, and talk about the importance of the ecosystem. And to do that, I have a panel with me here. Uh, we've got two persons uh, on link. Matthias Levrin, welcome from Accenture. And we also have Peter Gille from the Swedish e-health company Cambio. And together with me here in the studio, oh. Therese Treutiger from Microsoft Sweden. So welcome all three of you. So let's start with you, Therese. Um, how do you think that Microsoft's new data centers will fuel the ecosystem of partnerships and innovation in Sweden? With this kind of establishment and also the investment that Microsoft is doing now in Sweden, it's not just the investment in the data center. Here comes also lots of investment for the ecosystem, both locally in the regions of Sandviken, Gävle and Staffanstorp, uh, but also in the Microsoft startup community across Sweden. And uh, that will really be an opportunity for us, both regarding skills, but also about innovation. We heard before about the 24-7, and I would love to, in, in two years, to see more very concrete solutions like 24-7. And with this data center, uh, and the ambitions of, of uh, being operated in 100% renewable energy, but also the new innovative technology that this data center will be built upon. It will be a magnificent opportunity for us to create uh, a really competitive public sector, but also a competitive in the global landscape uh, industry as well. So I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, it's kind of a digital meeting point, this yes, data center. I think it's going to be interesting to see. Matthias, uh, talking about ecosystems, from Accenture's point of view, uh, how important is a vibrant ecosystem for your activities in, in Sweden? Well, it's exceptionally important. Um, I think Accenture we are, uh, and has always been a um, more or less a pure services <coughs> company. And um, our clients, whether they are in the public sector or in the private sector, they require some kind of combination of software, hardware, cloud platform and services to resolve their most challenging business problem, whether that is in you know, their growth agenda, their cost structure and, or, uh, or um, uh, security. So um, just, just on a per personal note here, I, uh, I would say that the most interesting innovation will happen at this intersection between hardware, software, cloud platforms, uh, and, and, and services. So um, um, again, exceptionally important to our ability to deliver value for, for our clients in the Swedish market. So, um, I mean, that sounds important, but uh, and would you say that ecosystems have become mm. more important lately? I mean, if you compare to like, uh, let's say 20 or 20, 10 or 20 years ago. Yes, and I, I would say, I would expect that to continue to be the case and maybe, maybe accelerating here. Um, <clears throat> I think we all who are participating today would agree that the, the pace of change in nearly every industry is going faster and faster, whether that is the, the, the expectation of the life cycle of the product or what we talked about a lot today, the requirements around sustainability and, uh, and the ecosystem. So uh, that would mean, in my view, that scale and specialization simultaneously will become more important and um, the stakes will just increase. So, on the, again, I would truly command, command, I would say, Microsoft for the courage they are showing in, in uh, making this massive investment in Sweden and providing a, I would say, a platform for the rest of us to innovate around and be part of their uh, full innovation ag uh, agenda and their uh, their. R&D capabilities, it's, it's, it's truly amazing. Okay, thank you, Peter. I think that's a clear message. Um, um, Peter, you're working within the health sector, and what importance would you say that these ecosystems have, or maybe I should I say that they should have in the public sector in Sweden? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. As uh, healthcare uh, needs to become more and more efficient, uh, we have the burden of an aging population uh, and healthcare, as you know, also now with the pandemic is very burdened. 
So the only way to effectivize that is through digitalization. And to do that, we need to be quicker and also use innovations in healthcare in a faster way. And to be able to do that, the, we need the ecosystem, to be an open ecosystem uh, and also being able to very quickly uh, put the solutions into work uh, faster than we do today. And that's why uh, an ecosystem like the one that Microsoft will provide will be one of the most important drivers to really drive that effectivization within healthcare. Uh, that's clear. Um... So uh, when you talk about Microsoft's role here in the data centers, in what way do you think that they, these data centers can support the growth of, of these ecosystems? Can you s explain that further, please? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the ecosystems, uh, uh, first of all, in healthcare today, in IT, there are many regulations and so on. So we need to be able to uh, live with those regulations and that's why it's important to have a data center for instance in Sweden because we cannot have uh, patient data being out of the country that's against the law basically so that's one of the things uh, supporting the regulations we have in Sweden and then sharing information not only between the uh, regions that we have in Sweden, but also within other caregivers like municipalities or private caregivers. Uh, and the cloud will enable us to do that in a much simpler way. Another important aspect is also that one of the things that will drive healthcare further is the ability to share information, to use it for AI or for research. As you know, healthcare is a very research driven um, task and that's why it's so important to also be able to share information in the cloud for instance see patterns within regions see patterns in um, diseases and so on and that is also something that uh, a cloud in Sweden can help us with Thank you, um, Peter. Matthias, uh, back to you. To broaden the perspective a little bit, what role do you think that ecosystems have for Sweden as a country of innovation that we always aim to be? I think, I think it's super important. And I, I, think, um, I think it's a competitive advantage for, for, for Sweden. I, I truly do. Um, if you look at, uh, for example, um, yeah, the pure research that they, they do every year. I mean, two things stand out about Sweden. One is openness, and the other is trust. Those are the two characteristics that normally stands out. And both of those, openness and trust, are the key building blocks to be successful in an ecosystem. So here, I think we have something fantastic to build on. And... Um, I think on, on openness, I, I think I can see that every day, the, the willingness of public organization and private organization to engage with, uh, with global uh, players who bring best practices from around the world, like Microsoft or Accenture, they're open to that. And, and on the trust side, I see a slightly, also slightly different behavior. We are more open to, co to engage in collaboration and discussions without 400 pages of legal documents, mm -hmm. which I see in, in a lot of places um, outside of Sweden. So both of these points, openness and trust, I, um, I truly believe they um, uh, create a uh, wonderful basis for us to drive differentiation and, and um, value creation here in Sweden. So. That sounds good to me. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, uh, Matthias just gave his, his view on uh, why ecosystems are important for Sweden as a country of innovation. But uh, how do you think that we could, in that case, improve our ecosystems in Sweden to get even better? Uh, I think one part is to uh, take away some of the regulations that we have in Sweden that doesn't, you know, uh, add value to the ecosystem. For instance, we have, uh, we, we need to be able to share data in a different way. And even if you have the technical 
ability now to do that. There are still some regulations that prevent us from doing that. So I think that is one important uh, part. And the other part is to make it easier, you know, to, to uh, get away from the technical obstacles that we often see and make it faster and easier to deploy solutions to different healthcare problems uh, instead of focusing on, you know, the technical difficulties that we always have. If we have everything in a cloud and we have things that are built on openness and standards and trust, uh, it's much easier to deploy new solutions and be more innovative and find easy solutions to difficult problems than if you always have to go through a lot of technical obstacles before you can deploy anything. It takes time and uh, people get exhausted and sometimes we don't even get the solutions in place due to regulations or technical difficulties. So get rid of the obstacles, be open and then use standards that makes it easier to deploy innovative solutions that can move healthcare forward. Thank you, Peter. I think that's a clear message. So um, to conclude this uh, session uh, on uh, ecosystems, uh, Therese, um, in what way would you say that Microsoft's data center establishment will support what Matthias and Peter are asking for here? I think both of them are really highlighting some key topics here uh, and what we need for Sweden, both the public sector, healthcare companies, but also the private sector in our industries. And it's definitely all the capabilities that will come with the data center, because you could just ask yourself, why is it important to have a data center in Sweden? Yes, there are certain capabilities and opportunities that will come with that. One of them is so that we will have a local data center with a lot of capacity, but also low latency. Latency is very important, for example, for healthcare, because you need to have it immediately, high capacity and with high security in demand. So that will be very important. And of course, also for the gaming industry, that will also be very important. But also something that both Matthias and Peter is, is raising here is the, is the data, the trust piece. Where is data stored? So with the data center region, as we will have now, you, we will have a full redundancy between the data center. And that means that we will have a data at rest in Sweden. And that will be utterly important for us if we would like to take financial services or public sector to next level and truly transform because we need that both for, for effectiveness but also for our competitiveness and of course leverage the sustainability possibilities. I think that is also key for us to be really competitive in the global landscape. So thank you, Therese. I think uh, you sent a great message that you were going to deliver what they ask for, actually. Uh, thank you, Matthias and Peter. Uh, thank you all for interesting comments on the importance of the ecosystems. So now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to wrap up the day. And for that, I'm going to uh, join Helen again. And here you are. Um, Helen, this has been a really intense hour. Welcome it back. Has, really. Let me first ask you if there was anything in particular that struck you as an important aspect of uh, sustainable transformation that you would like to highlight. Well, the first thing, it's just been amazing to see all these different aspects and how it actually all comes together. And I, I think I would like to go back to where we started, actually. This is about, it is about technology and tech intensity, and it is about value-based leadership. And those two need to come together. And to be successful, we need to build that digital infrastructure. We need to work with our people, the sustainable way of working, with the culture, with the leadership. And we need to have partnerships and ecosystems. And in many, oftentimes in a new way, which we just heard on the panel you had right here. So I think that's, that's fundamental. And I hope it's come across here that uh, Microsoft is making substantial investments into Sweden uh, with the announcements we have made here uh, today. And that's not just to fuel a Microsoft success. It really is to fuel that agenda for companies, public sector, and for the country of Sweden with the ambitious goals that Sweden has. Uh, so um, I'm thinking about a little bit another perspective. Um, 
when you think about it, to some it may seem strange that a data center with a bunch of service has to do so much to do with sustainability and the other aspects that we talked about today. So if you take a step back and if you look upon it in that way, what would you say? Yeah. No, I think it is a good perspective because it also gives a challenge, right? But I think it's so clear that cloud is underpinning everything we do today, whether it is how we collaborate or it is how we drive innovation or how we actually sustain life critical services, we need the cloud. Yeah. And to underpin the clown, we need the data centers. It's, it's, it's that clear and that has the effect on, uh, that we have to build and we have to use the data centers in the most sustainable way. It is really maybe never been more important. And that's why we are driving it both from design, through the use and with the waste. And the waste part we maybe haven't talked so much about before and I think this is actually critical for the country. Oh yeah. Um, now, I have another thought about this. I often say that digitalization is effectively blurring borders mm -hmm. between departments, between businesses, industries, and even countries. Yeah. So from that perspective, how would you say that today's topic, sustainability, trust, scaling the ecosystem, and even the infrastructure, how do they depend on each other? Yeah. Or is it even possible to separate them? No, I don't think it is uh, possible to separate them. I think it is blurring borders. I actually think even that's the big opportunity to blur borders, not to be a siloed society or a siloed company, uh, because that's how we built most of the things since 1950s. But I think this is the opportunity and this is the necessity to blur those borders, to have technology come together with those big hairy goals about sustainability, about value-based uh, leadership, to have the partnerships come together. And that's why we also come back many times today about trust, because trust needs to underpin for us to be a able to blur borders, which I think is a very good expression to explain what it is we need to do, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it, all in all, it sounds more human in, in, in a certain yes, way. I think uh, it is. Yeah, <laughs> I, I talk about you, uh, the human aspect. Looking ahead, um, another aspect that I know that you find important uh, and that has become critical in these times is the sustainability of work and leadership. Mm. So yeah. what do you think we need to do to support this kind of human sustainability? Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is very close to my heart and I think it, it uh, will set us apart actually how we manage that and and um, I think it's many organizations and companies are are finding themselves redefining work work is not some a place we go to it's something we do so what does that actually mean for how we lead how we take care of our uh, employees about our teams how we communicate and how we collaborate and this means that we need to focus on culture leadership and self-leadership and I actually think organizations who haven't invested yet in that absolutely must invest in that because that's what's going to keep us together and actually enable a sustainable lifestyle, I think. Time to wake up and do your homework. Yes, right. indeed. <laughs> Is there anything else that you think should be said today, Helen? No, I think maybe just to finish off with, I think we uh, hope we have seen here and shared today a very strong commitment to what is important for Sweden and that we are making a very significant investment behind it. In essence, we are teaming up with Sweden to become fossil free, to, for Sweden to continue to be leaders in innovation and to build an inclusive society with the help of digital skills. And the latter one is really important. And the work is not about Microsoft success. The work is about making our customers and partners and the country as such successful. And I'm very grateful for the partners and customers who have joined us here today, because they are leaders in sustainable transformation. And by working together with them, we're all accelerating that journey. So very grateful for them. and very grateful for everybody who's joined us for this hour and a half. Oh, yeah, sure. And thank you so much, Helen. But before closing now, um, I thank you very much. But before closing, uh, I know that we have a closing remark also from Jean-Philippe Courtois, who is Executive Vice President at Microsoft. Good morning, Sveria. I hope everyone is safe and well. It is my pleasure to talk with you today and be part of this exciting news. Microsoft has had a long-term commitment with Sweden. We indeed opened one of our very first international operations in Sweden more than 35 years ago. And since that day, we've been developing great partnership with 3,000 partners, but also public private companies and the public sector and supporting local communities. And we do that to empower people and organizations to achieve more in Sweden. 
At the place of visit Sweden uh, a number of times over the past 20 years, and I would love to come back whenever I can travel freely. What I love in particular about Sweden is the way the country has established such a great leadership when it comes to sustainability, innovation, and gender equity. And now these days, we are partnering even more closely with Sweden and the EU altogether to truly help recovering from the impact of COVID-19 and help building a more inclusive and a more sustainable future. We see enormous potential to support economic recovery and accelerate digital transformation in Sweden by investing in the local ecosystem. These new data centers will provide local companies with enterprise-grade cloud services and world-class innovation and serve customers all across Europe but also around the world. They will be two of the most advanced sustainable data centers we've ever designed as a company and the first to use the Vattenfall 24 by 7 matching solution along with power from 100% renewable energy, uh, plans as well for zero waste operations, and uh, an ambition of achieving zero carbon operations. You know, these are central regions will further our broader commitment to creating a sustainable low carbon future for all. I'm very proud of the work Microsoft Sweden team has done to partner with leading Swedish customers and support their digital transformation journeys. Customers like Sandy Koromat, that is leveraging the cloud to shape the future of manufacturing and achieving ambitious sustainability targets in the process. Partnership as well with organizations like Accenture and enabling a wide range of local communities to take full advantage of cloud and AI technologies. All plan to help support the digital skills of more than 150,000 citizens will empower more Swedes to take advantage of the employability opportunities these investments will bring. Microsoft is committed to the bright digital future of being built in Sweden, and we are here to provide our contribution. To all of you and your loved ones, stay safe and well to Centac. So thank you very much, Jean-Philippe, and thanks to everyone who contributed today, making this event possible, and in particular to each and every one of you out there who joined us today. We have heard some important announcements about uh, Microsoft's new Swedish data centers and more, pushing uh, digital transformation in a sustainable way and uh, helping the upskilling of the Swedish society and opening up new collaboration opportunities and building trust. So to get any more information about anything that was presented today, I invite you all to go to Microsoft's blog where there's a fresh blog post about today's event. Yeah, these are challenging times, as I said before, for everyone. But if we stay united, if we work together using the opportunities that we have and we get in a wise way, we will be able to co-create a sustainable future. And with that, my friends, I would like to thank you for joining us today. But please stay connected just a little while more. You will soon get a link on your screen for an evaluation of this event, and we would be really happy if you would participate. So. Thanks again and goodbye everyone and have a safe day.